Let's finish our brief foray into the world of point defects by talking about a concept that is quite simple, yet also very powerful for certain applications. So we are going to talk about solid solutions. I'll say in a minute what I mean by a solid solution and something called Vagard's Law. When I say a solid solution, you know, think about a liquid solution for a minute. Think about the solutions formed between water and ethanol. So we can have a homogeneous mixture all the way from pure water to pure ethanol, and we could go to any point in between. Well, you can do the same thing with solids. So in this example, we're looking at a solid solution between aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide. And so we can get a homogeneous crystal that has any composition between the two end members. What Vegard's law tells us is that the size of the unit cell is going to vary linearly from one end to the other. These are cubic materials with the sphalerite structure. Aluminum arsenide has a smaller lattice constant, just a little bit less than 5.653, and gallium arsenide has a larger lattice constant. And you can see that the evolution from one side to the other is basically a linear evolution. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is if we were interested in the dimensions of this cubic crystal that we're going to form as a solid solution, we could get any lattice parameter we want between the two end members. It also means that if we were to be making solid solutions of aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide, and we measured the dimensions of the unit cell, from that information, we could determine the composition. And the equation here, which gives the lattice parameter of any composition, reflects this linear relationship. We take the fraction of aluminum arsenide times its lattice parameter, plus the fraction of gallium arsenide times its lattice parameter. And as defined here, the fraction of gallium arsenide is 1 minus x. Now, sometimes there are deviations from Vagard's law. Not all solid solutions obey Vagard's law. And actually, my thesis advisor told me that Vagard really thought this shouldn't be true. And somewhat ironically now, when it, the relationship is linear, it's named for him. Here's an example from my own research of a solid solution that does not follow Begard's law. So we were looking at solid solutions between two perovskites. One, calcium ruthenium O3, which contains ruthenium 4 plus, And at the other end, calcium manganese O3, which contains manganese 4 plus. And what we observed is that when we got in the middle, we had this positive deviation from Vagard's law. The lattice parameter curve bows upward above the linear fit. Well, what leads to a deviation from Vagard's law? In this case, we have spectroscopic evidence that tells us what's happening here is in the middle, the oxidation states are not quite 4 plus and 4 plus. We see that we get some manganese 3 plus and ruthenium 5 plus. So sometimes you can have a kind of a charge transfer that changes the average oxidation state. And the size of manganese 3 plus ruthenium 5, that average size is actually bigger than the average size of ruthenium 4 and manganese 4. Another phenomenon that can lead to deviations from Vagard's laws when you go from a random arrangement of spheres that are different in size to an ordered arrangement of spheres that are different in size. And if you do get that ordering, that oftentimes is a more efficient packing and that will lead to a negative deviation from Vagard's law. Not only the dimensions of the unit cell can vary linearly, but there are some properties that also tend to vary linearly with composition. And when that happens, we would say that that property obeys Vagard's law. Probably the most widely recognized property that obeys Vagard's law would be the band gap of a semiconductor. So this is not always true, but oftentimes there might be a rather linear evolution of the band gap of a semiconductor as a function of composition. 
the mathematics behind this are basically the same as they are for a lattice parameter. So here, the formula above, we could use to calculate the band gap of any intermediate composition between cadmium sulfide and cadmium selenide. We can rearrange this formula to solve for x. That gives us this equation below. And the point of the equation below is that if we knew the band gap of an intermediate composition, we could calculate the value of x. That is, we could calculate what that composition is. This is quite important in this field of semiconductor devices. So oftentimes in this field, you have epitaxial thin films. And what I mean by that is you have a crystal, and then you grow another crystal, a very thin crystal, on top of the base crystal. And you're going to match bonds at the surface. And so the lattice constants of the different layers in this epitaxial device, it matters. We generally want to make the lattice constants as similar as possible. But at the same time, we want to vary the band gaps of the different layers of the crystal to get a certain function. Like, for example, this is a heterojunction laser. Now, in these devices, a really useful solid solution is the solid solution between gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide. And the reason why is because their lattice parameters, relatively speaking, are quite similar. So you can make solid solutions between one end and the other. Because the lattice doesn't change very much, you can still grow these epitaxial films. But we could tune the band gap from, let's say, over 2 electron volts for aluminum arsenide down to about 1.4 volts for gallium arsenide. Some of these solid solutions and the lines of them are quite important for LEDs. For LEDs, we want to keep on the solid lines where we have direct band gaps. Semiconductors are not the only area where this is important by any stretch of the imagination, but it is one area where these concepts are particularly useful. Let's finish with an example. Turns out that solid solutions of cadmium sulfide and cadmium selenide make effective pigments. And the color of the pigment can go anywhere from yellow through orange to red and something quite close to black on the cadmium selenide rich end. The usage of these pigments has declined rather significantly in recent decades due to concerns about the toxicity of cadmium, but that doesn't mean we can't do an example here. If you have pure cadmium sulfide, it has a yellow color, something just a little bit more yellow than cheddar cheese. If you have pure cadmium selenide, it's close to black. What happens if we want to make an orange pigment? Okay, so. I would say the ideal band gap for making orange is something, let's say, pretty close to 2.25. What composition do we need if we wanted to make the band gap exactly 2.25? Let's pause the video, use this formula, figure out the answer, and come back and we'll go over the answer. OK, to get the value of x here, all we really have to do are to plug in the band gaps for the end members. Let's call A cadmium sulfide with the band gap of 2.4, and B cadmium selenide with the band gap of 1.7. And the band gap of the intermediate composition, we want that to be 2.25. So when you plug that all into the formula, you get 0.21. So the way we've set this up is that this is going to be the selenium content in our solid solution. So crystal that had composition cadmium, sulfur 0.79, selenium 0.21, should have a band gap very close to 2.25, provided Vegard's law is followed. Now we could look at a graph here, assuming a, a perfect Vegard's law evolution. And you can see that the 0.21 does come in right at a band gap of 2.25. It's a little bit easy that you might get confused about whether this should be selenium 0.21 or sulfur 0.21. You know, where, what's the 1 minus x and what's the x? But just as a kind of reality check for ourselves, because 2.25 is much closer to 2.4 than it is to 1.7,
we know that the composition must be sulfur-rich, which is consistent with the answer that we obtained here.